All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness. Amen. That word of the Lord, which is helpful for teaching, here today comes to us from Psalm 56. For the choir director, a dove on distant oaks by David, a miktam, when the Philistines had seized him in Gath. Be merciful to me, O God, for a man pants as he pursues me. All day long an attacker presses against me. Those who spy on me pant as they pursue me all day long. Yes, many are attacking me boldly. On the day when I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God I praise his word. In God I trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? All day long they hurt my cause. All their thoughts against me are evil. They gather together. They hide. They try to trip me by grabbing my heels while they wait to take my life. Because of their wickedness, do not let them escape. In your anger, bring down the peoples, O God. You keep a record of my tossing and turning. Keep my tears in your bottle. Aren't they all listed in your book? Then my enemies will turn back on the day when I call. This is how I will know that God is for me. In God, I praise a word. In the Lord, I praise a word. In God, I trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? My vows to you are binding, O God. I will complete my thank offerings to you because you have delivered my life from death. Have you not delivered my feet from stumbling so I can walk before God in the light of life? This is the word of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. Mercy, grace, and peace are yours through your God and Father and through your Savior from sin, Jesus Christ, dear fellow redeemed. If you stop and think about it, crying is strange. I mean, really, think about it. When people get sad, their eyes expel salty water. What is that all about? Of course, really, you don't need to be sad to cry. We cry for a number of different reasons. We cry when we are sad, yes, but we also cry when we are happy. We cry when we are scared, or even in the case of infants, we cry when we are hungry. We cry because we can get emotional. There are many different complex emotions that cause one to cry, but crying is also so fundamental that it is literally the first instinct that we have when we are born into this world. The author of our psalm today, David, was well acquainted with crying. David had lived an interesting and a complex life up to this point of the psalm. After this, he would experience much more heartaches, and he would experience many more tears. But King David realized something vital here in this psalm. It's something that's hard to always see, especially through tears. But it is when this life is hard that this truth that David realized here is so vital to know. The Lord will deliver you. There are many problems that we will face in this world. There have been many times in the past when we have shed tears. Many times in the future, no doubt, as well. But no matter what happens, we know that the Lord will deliver us. He will calm us from our many fears, and he will wipe away every single tear. And so we pray, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our maker and redeemer. Amen. Even before this Psalm 56 starts, we are already introduced to the author and his particular problem. The heading of the psalm reads, A dove on distant oaks by David, a miktam, when the Philistines had seized him in Gath. Psalms in the Bible often have certain tunes that might have originally gone along with them. We have no example or way of knowing what those songs actually sounded like, but the title of this really makes me wonder, A Dove on Distant Oaks. It's a really interesting title for a song. I wonder what the tune of this psalm really was. As far as that term, miktam, 
It also is not really known to us. It could be some kind of musical or liturgical term. We don't really know. Some translate that term as mystery poem. But the circumstance that is referred to is something that we do know, something that is revealed to us in Scripture, when the Philistines sees David in Gath. There's only one such event that's recorded like that in Scripture. The occasion for this text is when David flees to the Philistine city of Gath to escape from King Saul. It's recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 21. Saul had grown jealous over his prodigy David, David had already been anointed king by the prophet Samuel, but Saul was not just going to let that happen. A perfect example of Saul's growing suspicion of David and his paranoia of David are when the two men come back from the land of the Philistines. Read from 1 Samuel chapter 18. Now it happened as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Then Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him, and he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. Of course, after this, the relationship between the two men soured. Saul tried to kill David several times. But David had many chances to retaliate, of course, and he would have many more after this in the future. But he refused. He refused to to heart to harm the Lord's anointed and Saul. The king of Israel was trying to kill him, So David fled to the safest place he could think. It would be safe because it was so dangerous. He fled to Gath in the land of the Philistines. At the same time, David had already killed many Philistines. So he pretended to be a crazy person to escape retribution. David would feign madness just to survive. Now, it isn't really clear in that example of David pretending to be insane to escape the Philistines, whether or not that was right or wrong. The Bible doesn't really tell us. But perhaps this psalm is a referendum on that event. Perhaps David realized after the fact that he should have just trusted in the Lord instead of acting crazy. There is no indication in Scripture whether or not, like I said, this is right or wrong, But this psalm really does point to that place where you can go when you are afraid, the Lord. And you can clearly see, of course, how distressed David is in this psalm. He starts off, Be merciful to me, O God, for a man pants as he pursues me. All day long an attacker presses against me. Those who spy on me pant as they pursue me all day long. To me, this description really paints a vivid picture David expresses his running, his fleeing from his enemies like one trying to escape from bloodhounds. You can just picture some animals just nipping at his heels, constantly panting and constantly pursuing him. Verse 6 says, They gather together, they hide, they try to trip trip me by grabbing my heels while they wait to take my life. King David before he was even King David here, had many things that he could have been afraid of. He was a stranger in a strange land. He wasn't just simply a stranger. He, in fact, was really well-known to the Philistines. He was the well-known Philistine killer. After all, he had made his moment of glory, which he, of course, credited to the Lord, when he killed their champion, Goliath. David was also a fugitive, the most powerful man in David's own country, who also happened to be his father-in-law, wanted him dead more than anything else. Saul was obsessed with finding David. It's easy to see why David could have been afraid. And it's kind of hard, I think, for us to get into that headspace of David here. We most certainly don't have to face things like this in our day-to-day life. Have you ever had your father-in-law 
try to throw a spear in you? Have you ever had to literally run for your life? Have you ever had to pretend to be insane just to live? I should hope not. But the feelings that David described here are very relatable to us. You don't need to go through a crisis to know what fear is. We're all afraid. We're all living in a time of fear. Will we ever be able to go to the store again without wearing a face mask? Will we ever be able to go to school in person again? Will there ever be a time when this pandemic isn't dominating the thoughts and hearts of our people? I would assume so, but who knows when that time will be. There are so many different things in this world that can cause us fear. Are we physically running from our lot for our lives? No, but that does not make the fear of losing your job any less real. David crystallizes something here, though, that is easy to forget and is a hard lesson to learn. When we are afraid, we need to look to the Lord. Verses 3 and 4. On the day when I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God I praise his word. In God I trust I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? I really like this psalm just from the way it's structured. First, it makes the claim from David, of course, and the Holy Spirit, that the author is being chased and hunted down. But then it goes on to conclude that he will trust in the Lord. But then it also does a very human thing after it establishes that, yes, he's being chased down and he will trust in the Lord in the face of that fear. It goes back to readdress his fears once more. He just can't get over it how evil his enemies are. My enemy is pursuing me. I'm going to trust in the Lord. But they're so terrifying that I need to just talk about it some more because that's how afraid I am. But of course, finally it goes back to that refrain, which is repeated once more. In God I trust, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? That's a very good question. At the end of the day, what can men do to us? Despite all that fear that David was no doubt feeling, he still knew he could trust in the Lord. And really, what can men do to us? What's the worst that mankind can throw at you? There are many different tears that we can shed. Many different emotions that provoke many different kinds of tears. But perhaps there is no worse kind of tear than the tears of fear. It's a terrible feeling, being afraid. Sometimes the fear itself is worse than even the trouble that you're facing. Yet no matter what happens to us, whatever men do to us is not the worst that can happen. It may seem like it. There are so many different terrible things that your mind can just think of off the cuff of what a man might do to me. But at the end of the day, suffering is pretty relative. We all deserve to suffer, to go to hell, to spend eternity in hellfire. That is the worst case scenario. It's like what Jesus concluded in our gospel lesson a few weeks ago. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. With humans, just getting us to calm down really can be a challenge. We don't think rationally when we're afraid. David knew it. He knew it right here. He pretended to be insane just to escape from the Philistines. But that's why the Lord is the ultimate deliverer. He first takes the time to calm our fears, and then he will deliver us from that terror. As another psalm clearly states, Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Not only does the Lord calm our fears, he also wipes away our tears. Verses 8 and 9, You keep a record of my tossing and turning. Keep my tears in your bottle. Aren't they all listed in your book? Then my enemies will turn back on the day when I call. This is how I will know that God is for me. 
That picture described here is also quite interesting. Keep my tears in your bottle. Tears are strange because they express any number of emotions and then they're gone. They evaporate. Even if somehow you were able to bottle up all your tears to keep them in a physical bottle, wouldn't they eventually evaporate anyway? How big is your tear bottle? Let's say for sake of argument that you were able to collect all of your tears throughout your entire life. How big would that bottle be? The Hebrew term here for the word bottle is most commonly used with the same concept for the term or the concept of a wine skin, so a rather large container. Would your tears fill up a wine skin? Would they fill up a two liter? How big would it have to be? Well, as I mentioned, it's hard to kind of put yourself in the headspace of King David here. Truly, he had a rough time. But that's not really the person that you're supposed to compare yourself to. We all shed tears. We all have had bad things happen to us. It's all quite relative. Don't compare your sufferings to King David here. Rather, compare your sufferings to David's greater son, King Jesus. It is in the person of Christ where what can man do to me really comes into focus. Do you think you have it bad? Yes, sometimes we do no doubt suffer in this world. But we truly do deserve it, don't we? We all have sinned. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. Truly, we all deserve to suffer for the evil that we ourselves have caused. But that... It's not the case with Jesus. He always kept the law of God perfectly. What happened to Jesus? True suffering. Isaiah 53 says, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. It was because of our evil that Jesus truly did become acquainted with grief. He had to come to this world to pay for the sins of of the world. By his perfect life and his innocent death, we are spared that terrible fate that we all deserved. Why would God listen to this desperate plea here of David in Psalm 56? Well, because of David's son, the son of David, Jesus Christ, what he would do on David's behalf. The same is true for you here today as well. Why would God calm your fears? Why would God wipe away our tears? Because of the Son of David, Jesus Christ. That is why God is indeed merciful to all of us. Make no mistake about it, Jesus was acquainted with grief. Jesus wept. He understood what it was to experience sadness in this life, on this earth. This is a very important part of the nature of of Jesus Christ. Christ, he was true God, yes, but he was also true man. Hebrews 4 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus knows what you're going through. Jesus knows what it is to be human. He can sympathize with us because he is one of us. Tears roll down the cheeks of the Savior just like they roll down ours. The difference is that Jesus truly knew suffering in a way that we never, ever will. He suffered the pains of hell on the cross. He paid for your sins there. He paid for my sins as well. It's at the foot of the cross where every single tear is ultimately wiped away. Every single toss and turn, every single struggle and tear that we go through is known to your God. At every single turn, we find deliverance through Jesus. That is why our tears are wiped away. He sees our distresses, and he delivers us out of them. 
but we still experience pain? Well, yes, no doubt, of course, we live in the veil of tears. But that's only on this side of eternity. The fact of the matter is, no matter what happens to us, our salvation is secured. Yes, we will shed tears from time to time, but that's only temporary. It's fleeting. It evaporates. When John had his revelation of that glorious future that awaits for us in heaven, he heard a voice from heaven say, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Well, what happened to the tears of David? Well, of course, after this, he was delivered. He eventually went on to become king of Israel, one of the most powerful men in the whole history of that nation. The deliverance of the Lord for David came because the deliverance of the Lord always comes. And that's why we take comfort and encouragement here today. When was the last time that you cried? When was the last time that you tossed and turned like David suggests here in the song? Was it even perhaps last night? We live in a perilous time, one with an uncertain future. There are many things that could happen to us that could make our eyes water, but that deliverance will always come. Why? Because we have already been delivered from death. You have delivered my life from death. Have you not delivered my feet from stumbling so I could walk before God in the light of life? No matter what happens to us in this world, in these uncertain times, your deliverance is sure. Yes, we may suffer here on this earth. Yes, we will no doubt shed many more tears in the future, just like we did in the past. But no matter what happens here, we will be with him there forever. We have been delivered from the punishment that our sins deserved. Jesus was well acquainted with grief to accomplish that end for you. Whenever grief we grieve or suffer here, it's nothing in the long run. Truly, man can do nothing to us because the man delivered us from hell. He calms our fears. He wipes away our tears forever. Amen.